We live in a nation that is known by God's people as one of the birthright nations, uh, Israel. Uh, the name uh, given to Jacob, and then that name came upon the 12 tribes, uh, as is discussed in, in the book of Genesis. And we see certain promises listed at the end of the book of Genesis, in Genesis 48 and 49. God's people, uh, those whom God has called to understand his precious truth, recognize what Israel is, this, this precious truth of Israel. Uh, who is Israel in the modern day age? Most of society sees Israel and they think of the Jews that are in the Holy Land and, and some of the Jews that are scattered across the globe in different places. God's people, as a result of understanding uh, the prophecies of, of God's word, uh, have, have come to understand uh, something much more greater than that. Uh, something that helps us understand as we see all these things going on around us in the world that begins to help us get a better picture of how things are happening the way they are, how it could coalesce, and, and as a result of that, we, we can have a certain peace of mind through that understanding of that, of that basic uh, grasp of the identity of the, 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 uh, these, these tribes of Israel, specifically the ones on whom the blessings rest. Let's look there in Genesis 48. Uh, actually, let's go to Genesis 49 first. We'll hit the highlights here of, of what are familiar to, to most of us who have been in the church for many years. We see this, we understand this, we grasp this. I ask you today, uh, what significance does that play in your life spiritually, knowing this? Uh, what, what significance spiritually does that play in your life and in my life? Uh, some would say that this teaching of the church is one that, ah, you know, it's, it's got a little bit of, of history involved, and does it really make a difference in, in anything in our, in, our, in our Christian and in our spiritual, spiritual lives? Uh, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the answer is yes, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a bit. Genesis 49 makes a very powerful statement in verse 1. We, most of us know this well, but this is very important in grasping this. Jacob called his sons together, and, and he said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. When he's talking about the last days, he's not talking about how as they get a little bit older uh, and before they bite the dust, this is what's going to happen to them. He's not talking about that. He's not getting into that. He's talking about the last days, <laughs> the end uh, as, as we near the return of Jesus Christ, uh, the, the end of, of, of this time where the God of this world is, is here uh, prior to Christ's return, prior to Satan the devil and his demons being put in the abyss for a thousand years. He's talking about what's, what's going to happen in these last days. And then he begins to state these prophecies of these various, uh, these various sons and, and the nations that will arise from these sons. Look at, look at Genesis 49, verse 22. As we deal with Joseph, the fruitful bough, Joseph, the son uh, on whom these incredible blessings are mentioned. Joseph, verse 22, is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. But his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, by the God of your father, who will help you, and by the Almighty who will bless you. Now, now think about this, brethren. He, what he's talking about is what's going to happen in the last days. In the last days. Uh, he says, 
He'll bless you with the blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb, of, of population, of, of reproduction of more and more people, blessings of the breasts and of the womb. The blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. That is a, an incredible blessing that was, is to be passed upon the sons of Joseph, the children of Joseph, in the last days. Now some will say, okay, okay, well, you know, uh, this, this really can't be that these nations are still in existence today. Uh, really, when you look at the, the, what happened to Israel, the northern tribes, what happened to the southern tribes taken into captivity, all of that, uh, that what, what, what significance does that have? Where are they now? How, how, is, that, how is that in place? Well, let me, let me ask you this. So in the time of these original 12 tribes, even, even up until they're, they're inheriting the land in the land of Canaan, when, when was East Ephraim, when was Manasseh at this kind of blessing level? When was it? It, it, it never happened. It never happened. Especially when we look back at Genesis 48 and he and we see Jacob that's putting a special blessing on the lads, on the sons of, of Joseph, on Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, Joseph's, verse 17 of chapter 48, when Joseph saw that his father laid his hand, laid his, his right hand on the head of Ephraim, and it displeased him. Uh, Ephraim was the younger, the, the right hand should be on Manasseh, the older one, because he'd crossed his hand. To re, so it displeased him, and he took hold of his father uh, Jacob's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head into Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, No, not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. The firstborn gets the, the, the major blessing. Put your right hand on his head, is what he's getting at here. Verse 19, But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. When did that happen? When did that happen when Israel inherited the land of Canaan? When did Ephraim become a multitude of nations? When did that happen? It didn't. It didn't happen. So when it says what shall befall you in the last days... It can't be talking about the time period of, of prior to the Israelites going into captivity, the northern kingdom going into captivity when Assyria conquered them, or, or even uh, the southern kingdom when Babylon conquered them in the, late, in, uh, the mid, mid 580s BC. So he said, so he blessed them that day, saying, verse 20, By you Israel will bless, saying, May God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And thus he set Ephraim before Manasseh. Uh, let's see, a little bit earlier, he talks about, uh, as, as we had discussed, he talks about Manasseh becoming this great nation. And, and then Ephraim becoming this company of nations. When, when we look at the historical uh, events that have taken place as we live in the last days, we, it is, it's, it's undisputed. Uh, what, what company of nations, what group of nations, what multitude of nations has, has been more powerful than the British Empire? Uh, it, as, as we've said in previous messages, five times the size of the Roman Empire, in incredible wealth, the sea gates, all the sea gates, the land gates, uh, and then you couple with that the greatest single nation ever in, in the latter days, America. There, there, it's, it's in, you can't dispute that. It, it's, it's, it's indisputable. Uh, the, the, the power and the might and the sea gates and the control and the influence that the United States of America uh, has had on that. And when we, we trace the travels of uh, the northern tribes as they were taken into captivity by the Assyrians and migrated into Europe, into Great Britain, and then on to America, we, we see this. We see God's promises coming 
uh, to pass with these great na- with these nations. Why? Because they were great. No, because God made a promise. He made a promise to Abraham. He made a promise to Isaac. He made a promise to Jacob. And he put that name, that blessing of, of that extra blessing on the firstborn. He took it away from Reuben and gave it to Joseph. And it went to Joseph's two sons. This, this tremendous blessing. We here in America are the recipients of not anything that we've done, but we're the recipients of, of God's blessing that God decided to pour out on faithful Abraham down through the patriarchs to this day. We take no credit for that. That is God's doing. God set that in place, and God has made that so because God doesn't lie. (laughs) He doesn't lie. He doesn't lie. Uh, So as, as an introduction, as we think about that, I want to address a concept today. On, on the one hand, brethren, we've got, we've got in Scripture uh, a physical nation that God dealt with, with Israel. And, and we also see here in Scripture that they would become a multitude of nations and then another one would become a great nation. God set in place uh, these physical blessings that were, were going to come down through a certain people because God deemed it so. That's the only reason God deemed it so. So we, we see that going through. And in Scripture, we, we see descriptions of God saying, if you, if you follow me and you do this and you do this, you will receive this and this and this. Physical blessings for physical people and other individuals as they meld into that, that those nations that are, are blessed by God who have the birthright promise, they also are blessed. So we see, we see that promise going through. This, brethren, is a tremendous blessing. It's a tremendous insight that God has given us uh, to, to understand that because it unlocks all kinds of prophecies that would really be confusing otherwise. Uh, but secondly, let's turn uh, to Deuteronomy 5. Deuteronomy 5. So while that is a, a, a very important factor, there is another dimension going on. The law of God has always been spiritual, has it not? Romans 7, the law is spiritual. It's always been spiritual. Uh, the Old Testament law, it is, it is spiritual. It is a spiritual law. But the law was not written on the hearts of the people. It was written on, on uh, hearts of stone. Uh, they, the, the, the people of Israel, the physical nation of Israel, were, were going to be given physical blessings and promises uh, that they would re, uh, achieve as they walked in God's ways uh, in terms of, of following these laws that he set. Even though the law was spiritual, they were not. <laughs> They, they were not. How do we know that? Uh, scripture tells us very clearly. Uh, Deuteronomy 5, let's start in verse, verse 23. Deuteronomy 5, verse, verse 23. So it was, and this was just after uh, they reiterated again uh, for the second time the, the Ten Commandments uh, in an earlier part in, in, in this chapter. Deuteronomy 5, verse 23 now. So it was, he says, when you heard the voice from the midst of the darkness while the mountain was was burning with fire. This was in the giving of the commandments and all that back back in Exodus. He says uh, that you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and and your elders, and you said, this is what Moses is reminding them that the people said to him, and you said, surely the Lord God has shown us his glory and his greatness, and we've heard his voice from the midst of the fire. We've, we've seen this day that God speaks with man, yet he, yet he still lives. Uh, now, therefore, why should we die? We don't, we don't want to bite the dust. Uh, for this great fire will consume us if we hear the voice of the, the eternal, our God, any more uh, then we shall die. For who is there of all flesh who has heard the voice of the living God speaking from the midst of the fire as we have and lived? Verse 27, you go near... And you, meaning Moses, you go near and you hear all that the Lord our, our God may say. And tell us all that he says uh, to you. And, and we'll hear and do it. 
So the eternal, uh, the, then the eternal heard the voice of, of your words. You spoke to me, and the eternal said to me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people, which they have spoken to you. They are right in all that they have spoken. You know, they are, they are right. They're showing you, uh, Moses, respect in this. Uh, uh, and then, he, then it, it's like there's, the, there's a stop and a thought uh, here. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me. Oh, that they had a heart in them. These are the people that are getting ready to go into the land, land of Canaan. Their, their, their parents and others have already died uh, in those past 40 years. These are the ones that are getting ready to go in. Oh, that they had a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments, that it might be well with them, with their children forever and ever. Tell them, go to your tents, but as for you, stand here by me, and I'll speak to you, Moses, all the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments. Be careful uh, to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. Be careful about that. Don't turn to the right. Don't turn to the left. Walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live, that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which you possess." Deuteronomy 29. Deuteronomy 29 takes it to the next step. And this is something, brethren, that gives us great peace as we look at uh, what, what God's people have been given. God's people have been given an understanding of these physical promises and, and, physic and prophecies of nations of what would happen in the end. We've, we've been given that to give us understanding as we see the world around us. Uh, but, but he also says that, that there's not a heart in those people to follow him. Not only that, he says in verse 4 of chapter 29, yet the Lord, this is Moses saying this, yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive him. Not, not only that God says, oh, that there were a heart in them that they would do this, Moses is saying that God did not give them a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear to this very day. That is tremendously important. That is tremendously important in understanding the plan of God. That God, in working with physical people, a physical nation, nations that would become company of na companies of nations, nations that would receive incredible blessings down through uh, the years, and especially in the last times, the last ages, to see what's happening, still... He is saying that God has not given them a heart to perceive and eyes to see and hear to this very day. He said of the Jews that the veil still uh, uh, was, was over them. We, we, we read that in the New Testament. So, so with that understanding, uh, with that understanding of, of grasping the, the, the spiritual nature of the law, that the law is spiritual, Romans 7, 14, and that God didn't even put in a heart, a heart in them to grasp the spiritual nature of the law. The church is, is able to, to make sense of this because we're living under the terms of the new covenant. So as, as, we look, as we look at that in place, we also see this in place, that God now... Uh, with, with, with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and with the beginning of the New Testament church, the New Covenant church, we, we see that God's people, it doesn't matter what we are, what, what race we are, what ethnicity we are, Greek, Gentile, Scythian, whatever our, our ethnicity is, it, it means nothing because, it's, as Galatians tells us, we are of the seed of Abraham. All of us who have received God's Holy Spirit, we are the Israel of God. And as a result of being the Israel of God, we then begin to grasp the spiritual intent of the law that's always been there. God, God's people get that. Now, does that mean that, that God's people say, well, this, this thing that's going on over here, these, these physical blessings and, and all of this that's going down through time until Christ returns and into the millennium and some of the different prophecies that are in the Bible about the various nations that extend all the way into the, the, 
the, the millennium. We see uh, discussions about the judgment, the queen of Nineveh rising. We, we, it talks about these various nations. Tyre will rise up and say this. Uh, does that mean with the new covenant that all this nation stuff and all these prophecy things don't mean anything? They're there. They're there and they're fully in force. But also over here, we've got God's people that understand the new covenant that are Israel, no matter what our race, no matter what our ethnicity, we are of Israel and we see the spiritual nature of the law, the spiritual intent of the law, and we walk under the new covenant. We walk under that as the Israel of God. So e even though we, are, as we, we as a church are living under the terms of the new covenant, the prophecies of the physical nations as described in the Bible remain in place, including the blessings and cursings chapters, including uh, the, the, the time of, of uh, Jacob's trouble in the end, of, of what's going to happen to uh, the nations of, of Israel, uh, of what we understand to be Israel. In the end time, as right before Christ returns, the time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation, all of that, that that's going to come upon uh, these nations, the cursings, the prophecies, all including the blessings of, of what's going to take place in the millennium. Brethren, this <laughs> represents a vital key. It is a vital key for us, a precious truth giving us understanding of what is to come. What is to come about God's mercy? What is to come about God's wrath? What is to come about God's mercy again? Uh, and, and, and God's wrath in the end? All of these things, it gives us that understanding that, that goes into the millennium. It goes into the great white throne judgment. It goes into eternity. It is a, a precious truth. When we think of the second resurrection, or this resurrection that happens at the end of the thousand years, when all of mankind uh, who has ever lived and died is raised, and they're brought up, uh, if, we, if we understand passages like Romans 11 uh, that says, uh, and he will have mercy on all, and so all Israel will be saved. Concepts like that. When, when does that happen and how does that happen? Uh, we, we, we don't grasp that unless we understand the, the, the situation of the nations and, and the way that plays out. When we think of Ezekiel 37 that we read every, every uh, eighth day of the feast, that, that last day, and we go through where he puts bones back together and he puts flesh back on them and raises these, these human beings back to life. And he says, this is the whole host of Israel here. These are human beings that, that God raises up and he says, and they, they think their hope is lost. And he says, no, I'm going to put my spirit in you and, and you're going to come into your, your land and, and be blessed and all that he says that's going on there in Ezekiel 37. We can fit that knowledge and that understanding in based on the, the situation that we know of, of the physical prophecies that are going through of the nations. We see God raising up all of these Israelites that have ever lived because otherwise you come back to well Deuteronomy and, and what he's doing here, the fact that God didn't put a heart in them to per perceive, that's a harsh God. How could he do that? How could God be that kind of a God to do that to people, to not even, to, to give them all of these things where you don't do this, you're going to die. You're going to have this happen and this happen, you're going to die, and yet at the same time, God, God didn't put a heart in them to perceive. Who, who could serve a God like that? God's people can serve a God like that because we see God's plan of salvation. We see what he's doing when he raises all of them up in the great white throne judgment and then opens their eyes to that truth and gives them a chance to, to, to live it and also be a part of the family of God as those in the first resurrection are. Okay, so I'm speaking to an audience that pretty much knows that. I'm speaking to an audience that pretty much knows that. But brethren, I want you to know, I want you to know that there are, there are offshoots out there that, that don't teach what we teach that don't teach that the same way, that, that see that as a much different kind of a, a scenario. Uh, well, I'll get into that here in just a second. Uh, 
one of the things that, uh, that groups within the scattered uh, offshoots of the church uh, will sometimes do is to seek to minimize the truth of the understanding of, of Israel, of the blessings that God prophesied would take place for physical Israel. And they cite several reasons. I've talked with individuals about this. Uh, one of the reasons uh, that they, they, they feel is that where does it say in the Bible that America is the single most blessed nation on the earth? Where does it say that? Where does it say that, that, that the, the, uh, the great company of nations that would have these kinds of blessings that we read in Genesis 49, Genesis 48, where, where is that in the Bible? Because the Bible uh, stopped being written, what, 95, 96, somewhere around there, A.D., when uh, the book of Revelation was written, the final books were, were, uh, were written. Nothing's been written since then. So we shouldn't we shouldn't go into necessarily historical records and, and extrapolate who this might be. We shouldn't, we shouldn't go there. Therefore, uh, it's a bit risky to talk about that, so we'll just not address that. That won't be an area of emphasis. Another reason, some believe that this teaching does not foster or create a healthy, welcoming, inclusive environment within the church. So for us to, to teach that, for us to teach that there, uh, there are these physical nations and certain ones are blessed, well, what about those, those people that are out there in society that may not be of Manasseh or may not be of uh, the uh, descendants of Ephraim? Well, that, that will, would create a less of an inclusive atmosphere uh, as, as a church, and as a result... We, we really just should minimize this or not discuss it at all. Uh, to do that, brethren, to do that begins to take, you begin, a person who has been in the faith and understood the faith, to, to all of a sudden take that position, uh, we don't realize the degree to which that begins to cause us to veer off from the basic understanding of the plan of God. As I've talked with individuals that begin to then grasp a, a different construct of what is the great, uh, the great white throne judgment. What is this second resurrection? What is this, this, this raising up that's going to take place? I've seen individuals go to more of a concept of this is the only day of salvation. This is the only day of salvation. So that when all of these individuals are raised in this, this resurrection that takes place after the thousand years of finish and, and after Satan has been uh, uh, cast in the lake of fire. Uh, so uh, these people are raised and a judgment is made right then and there by the great judge himself, Jesus Christ, because he understands the hearts and minds of men. So he makes a judgment on all of them at that point, whether or not they are in the lake of fire or are in uh, get to have eternity. Uh, so, so now this is the day of salvation, so we must, we must get the message out to everybody because this is their chance. Well, th but then you say, okay, now wait, wait a second. So, so, so God desires all to re come to repentance and come to the knowledge of, of, the, of the faith and all that. Uh, so what, what does that mean then for individuals who have, who have never heard the truth or understood the truth and then they live and die, and then they're raised in this great white throne judgment. What happens to them? Uh, and, and that's where it gets wonky. It gets wonky. What, what, do we, what do we believe? What do we teach? We teach that God will raise all of those people up, and they will have their first opportunity at salvation. They will, as, as, as we have had, the books will be open, the, the books of the Bible will be, will be open, and they, just like the books of the Bible are open for us now, who have our opportunity for salvation, and they will be, their eyes will be open to understand the truth, and they will have that opportunity. Uh, uh, there are offshoots that don't teach that, that teach no, no, they, they, they get their chance in this life, and then Christ raises them up and raises them up and makes a judgment there because he knows the mind and heart. Well, okay, but, but they never knew. So then, then you have to then begin to work through that and say, well, it must be then 
that what they did know, even though they maybe didn't have the whole truth, and they kind of, they quote a little bit from Romans 2, where it says about, well, they, the Gentiles who don't have a law to themselves, when they know certain things and they do certain things, then they'll be judged at least by what they know. So in a sense, what you've got is the pygmy who, uh, who was in Borneo or wherever they were that believed it was okay to eat people. They, they, they could eat people, but it, so they didn't understand the truth about that. But they did in their culture, even though they didn't have the law of God, they did understand stealing. And stealing was bad. So if you're a pygmy in this life who didn't have the understanding of God, but you understood this about stealing, and to the degree that you were convicted and lived that, when Christ raises you up in the, in the second resurrection, then he will judge you based on that. That's crazy. That's crazy. But that's where, that's where that stuff goes. Uh, but, but again, as, as we understand the, the plan of God through these physical nations, and the plan of God through the new covenant of what he's teaching us, we see how both come in place. We, we see the, the, the basic truths of, of Christ returning. You've got the, the small flock that understands the new covenant, that's living under the terms of the new covenant, that's changed in the first resurrection. And then those who live through that horrible great, white, great, uh, great tribulation, they're alive, it's a remnant of society, and they begin to be taught in the millennium. Those, those people begin to be taught. If this other thing were in place, why would you even need to have a millennium? You don't need to have a millennium. Christ will just judge you right there. He'll judge you. Boom. You're in, you're out. I know your heart. That, that's not how he does it. Why does he have a thousand years? He has a thousand years because these people that, that come through the great tribulation that live will have their opportunity to have the laws written in their heart. When, when, when the thousand years ends and, and here comes the great white throat judgment and all these people are raised up, snap judgment, boom. He's not going to do that. He's going to do what he's always done, he, as he's done with us, what he's going to do with the people in the millennium, what he's going to do with these people that he raised up and he puts flesh and blood on them again and gives them the opportunity to be a part of his spirit. That, that's, a plan, that's a plan. It makes sense. It makes sense with a God who loves us and understands he wants all mankind to be a part of his family because he is a great and loving and merciful God that gave his son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But these, these, are, these are principles that, that we see in place and we see in the millennium God working through the nation of Israel to bring all the nations to him. He begins, and then he says, Assyria, my people, Egypt, my people. God set this in place as the master potter to make this process possible to bring all mankind into his family. It is a tremendous, tremendous understanding that God has given his people. Do you appreciate that, brethren? Do you appreciate that? I submit to you that the biggest, one of the biggest challenges that is facing this church, that will face this church, is the understanding of doctrine, the importance of doctrine, the importance of belief, of what we believe in, and, and how that will carry us through. We have people that came into the church in the 60s and 70s, this massive group of people that came in and they left a traditional Christianity that they realized was filled with error, one of just the religions of Babylon. Now, Satan is the god of this world, and they recognized that and came in that. And, and some really grasped those truths. And we had another generation that, that came in there, my generation, that kind of grew up in that. And then all of a sudden, all these changes are happening in the mid-'90s. And, and it's, uh, you know, uh, for some of us, it just kind of wasn't a big deal. Oh, we get to do this now. But we hadn't really proved the difference between what the truths of God were and what the, and what the, the false teachings were out there in society. And, and some of us kind of had a wake-up call and said, I've got to get back into this word. What do I believe? What do I really believe? What is really true? I must worship him in spirit and truth. I've got to follow that. I've got to walk in that. And others was, you know, it's, it's just not that important. I, I am a spiritual person. I can worship God on any day of the week that I choose. Uh, and and then, we see, then we saw this revival from that. In, in the greater churches of God. This attention to doctrine. Yes, these things are important. The Sabbath is important. The holy days are important. The understanding of the plan of God is important. And then we have another generation goes where it's, it's, things are going well. It's smooth. 
How important are those teachings and are those, those truths, and how much do we really grab onto them? Uh, because the degree to which we grab onto them and make them a part of us and write them on the fleshly tables of our heart is the degree to which we can go forward in, in this very, very challenging world uh, over which uh, Satan uh, is, is the god. So thinking about that, uh, we, uh, we come to a, 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 po- a passage that I'd like us to consider now. Let's, let's if we could, go to 1 Corinthians 10. So several truths are running side by side in God's word, uh, and these truths do not conflict uh, with one another. The truth of the, the physical prophecies of physical nations and the blessings of those nations, those are in place. They do not conflict with the new covenant. They don't conflict at all with the new covenant. Those, those are running in place in terms of the prophecies of, of the various nations that will take place down through, the, down through time that will take place right up until the return of Christ. We have scriptures of, of prophecies of physical nations in the millennium and, and how God will work with those and, and, and work with those people. As I mentioned, we see nations rising and being talked about in the great white throne judgment. Uh, that, that doesn't conflict with the understanding of the new covenant. We understand who the Israel of God is. It's those, regardless of ethnicity, that are of the seed of Abraham because they have God's Holy Spirit. We recognize that, the new covenant. Both of those work in tandem with one another. What I'd like to spend the rest of of time on at this point is a third uh, truth that, that runs alongside of these other two. And that is simply this, the duality of the blessings and cursings. The blessings and cursings chapters are found in Leviticus 26 in Deuteronomy 28. I submit to you that one of the best ways to to go through Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 is to consider the duality of those passages. The duality not only of the, uh, the, the physical blessings and cursings that would come upon the, the people of Israel down through the ages right up until the very end as we understand Jacob's trouble and the church, the Israel of God, spiritual Israel. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 10 in, in a sense, speaks to this. Some of you are ahead of me with this thought, but it speaks to this. Uh, it speaks to this because it's so critical in our, in our own uh, understanding as the new covenant church of God. Moreover, brethren, verse 1 of chapter 10, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. Well, to whom is he writing here? He's writing to the Corinthian brethren. Yes, you have some Jews there, but you got a bunch of Gentiles. And he's saying, hey, yeah, yeah, you are of the seed of Abraham. You are of the seed of Israel in that respect because of, of your position. You look to Israel as fathers. Uh, in, in part of the old covenant, yes, they, they were. Even though whatever ethnicity you are, he's saying here to the, the Corinthian brethren, uh, we still consider them the fathers because they're the foretype of what we are presently as the Israel of God. So he says here, uh, you know, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and, and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ, Christ the Messiah. He was the being with whom they interacted. No man seen God the Father at any time. Uh, so the, the one with, and no one has heard his voice, as it says in, in, in John. So the individual, the God being, uh, the one who often manifested himself as Yahweh, Mr. Dr. Levy gave a great message, if you've not heard that, on the nature of God. But, but Yahweh, in, in, some, in many situations in the Old Testament, is speaking of Jesus Christ, the Word, the Messiah, because he... He, people have heard his voice and, and, uh, and interacted with him, but no man has seen God at any time, the Father, John 1.18. So Christ was there. He was there with them. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, big statement here. 
These things became our examples, you and me, the people, the, the, the new covenant church, no matter what their in ethnicity there in, in Corinth, they became our examples for what reason? To the intent that we not lust after evil things as they lusted and do not become idolaters as were some of them. Brethren, the, the, one of the biggest things that, that Israel continued to battle in their history was idolatry. One of the biggest things that the New Covenant Church of God continues to battle is what? Idolatry. Idolatry. To what degree is spiritual idolatry a part of our lives? Is there anything that we worship, that we bow down to and worship spiritually that is above God? Is there anything that, uh, of which we are covetous, that uh, as covetousness is idolatry? So in, he's saying it, that, that, all of that was written for us today. Don't become idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and rose, uh, drink, drink and rose up to play. Let us, neither let us commit sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is a huge problem in the world. It is a major problem in the church, people involved in sexual immorality. It is a major problem, be it porn, be it, be it uh, inappropriate uh, activities between uh, boys and girls. Uh, uh, we've got the LGBTQ society, all of that thing. Sexual immorality is huge. One of the reasons that we look back to the Old Testament, as he says, is, is look back to say sexual immorality is very bad. It is destructive. It will destroy you spiritually. You can come out of that. He says, don't do that. Don't commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. Let us not tempt Christ, as some of them also were tempted and were destroyed by serpents, nor complain, as some of them also complained, as were destroyed by the destroyer. All these things happened to them because they were written for our warning, for us today, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And here we are, brethren, here we are at the ends of the ages. The ends of the ages have come. So take heed, whoever thinks he stands, lest he fall. No temptation has taken you, uh, overtaken you, but such, is the common, such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will make a way uh, of escape that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge yourselves. Judge for yourselves what I say. Judge for yourselves what I say. I think of, I think of that. I, I think of uh, the lives of, of, of all of us here. I think of individuals who have, have turned from these kinds of things and have, have, have walked in God's ways as a result of recognizing the error of their ways and, and come back to that realization of, yes, I did mess up, but I learned from the example of Israel. I learned of, of, of what the situation is, is that I uh, am, am the temple of the Holy Spirit as God places his spirit in me. I must strive to live a godly life and learn from the examples of this physical nation of Israel. So we come to the, the duality of the blessings, the duality of the blessings uh, th that we see in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. Let's go there as we uh, spend the remainder of the message primarily in these areas. The duality of the blessings and cursings. Physical people, physical nations, prophecies playing out in the end time, but written for us, spiritual Israel as well, where it doesn't matter whether we're Hispanic African-American, Pacific Islander, pygmy in the church, if, if you are a pygmy in the church. It, it doesn't matter what we are. It doesn't matter how mixed we are. Uh, Latino, uh, Latino, uh, uh, American, Latino, Spanish with a little spice of German, Italian. It just, it doesn't matter. But, but the, the duality is there in terms of, of the, of the physical and the spiritual, because these were written for our example.
So look at Leviticus 26 here, and let's draw some parallels, some parallels uh, in our own lives as the New Covenant Church, as we think of this nation at present, as we think of, of uh, Great Britain, as we think of many of the countries of Europe that are of, of uh, Israelite descent. One of the things that I, I came across this week was an article uh, from Christianity Today, July 15th. The number of people of Britain in Britain identifying as Christian uh, is in dramatic decline, according to the latest figures from the British Social Attitudes Survey. The proportion identifying as Christian stands at 38% now, uh, just a little bit over one in three, uh, down from half in 2008 and nearly two-thirds in 1983. So 93, 03, 13. In 35 years, it went from two-thirds claiming to be uh, to be Christian of, of some sort, down to 38%. At the same time, there's been a continued rise in the percentage of Brits identifying as Muslim from 1% in 1983 to 3% in 2008 to 6% in 2018. There's also been an, a substantial increase in those who do not identify with any religion, up from 31% in 1983 to over half over half of those polled in 2018 do not identify with any religion. <laughs> you think, think about that. Think about that to the degree that we, we understand 2 Thessalonians 2 and, and Revelation 13 about being able to be duped by a, a figure in the end time that can do these miracles. Uh, and again, this is the folks that are not even claiming to be uh, religious at all, not claiming to be any, in, any, in any way just in that respect. How, how, are, how are they that have really no knowledge of the Bible, how are they going to be able to interpret those kinds of things as they exist? Leviticus 26, look at the blessings uh, from a spiritual perspective here. These are physical blessings that, that would come as, as Israel obeyed God down through the years. Here it is. It's about idols. Don't make idols for yourselves. Are there any idols that you or I have made for ourselves? Any carved images or sacred pillars that we're rearing up for ourselves? Nor shall we set up an, an engraved stone in your land and, and, and bow down to it. For I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Keep my Sabbaths and, and, and reverence my sanctuary. Well, where's the sanctuary? <laughs> the sanctuary, again, is the temple of God. It is, it is God and Christ dwelling in us, uh, in our bodies. Uh, do, we, do we honor God through our bodies? Do we honor God in our keeping of God's Sabbaths, plural? Are we doing that? If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, then think about this. This is what he says will happen physically. Think about this from a spiritual perspective. I'll give you rain in its season. The land shall yield its produce, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last till the time of vintage, and the vintage shall last till the time of sowing. You'll eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. We see as, as we go through life that God will be with us. He'll guide us. He doesn't promise us a, a health and wealth gospel uh, of, of riches beyond measure in terms of physical blessings, but he does promise to give us food and raiment. And, but, but this, from a spiritual perspective, the peace of mind, the comfort that God gives us, the understanding, the fullness, the spiritual fullness of, of eating of Christ and eating of the bread of, un, uh, of sincerity and truth, uh, of what that does for us. Look at verse 6. I will give you peace in the land, and you shall lie down. None shall make you afraid. I'll get rid of the, the land of evil beasts and the sword will not go through your land. You'll chase your enemies and they'll fall by the sword. Five of you shall chase a hundred and a hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight. Your enemies shall fall by the sword by you. We see that in, in the way this nation over the years as, as God blessed it was able to conquer uh, evil dictators and evil, evil countries. But think about this 
from the spiritual perspective. Think about this from the New Covenant perspective. Think about this uh, 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 against whom you and I battle, Satan the devil and his demons, the, the spirit world, the wicked spirits in high places. Consider those kinds of things that as, as we yield to God fully, and, and walk in his ways, there is a peace of mind that comes. There is a submission to God or resisting the devil, and he flees from us. It, there is a peace of mind, a perfect uh, 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 living our lives out of perfect love and not fear that gives us comfort through whatever we face. Look at, uh, keep your finger there, look at Philippians 4, verse 7. Philippians 4, verse 7. in the middle of the how to pray with, with thanksgiving, uh, making supplications to God. And, and then we see this verse in verse 7 that is so critical to the new covenant church, those who have been given the mind of Christ, those who are walking in God's ways and, and, and who possess the Spirit of God. The peace of God which, which surpasses all understanding, then it guards our minds, it guards our hearts through Jesus Christ. Anybody that has gotten caught in some of these things that we read about in 1 Corinthians 10 that take a hold on us, that, that are uh, the, the, the work of the enemy, as we realize we don't walk uh, according to God's ways and we allow that enemy in, any of us that has been there, you know, you know what that is like. It is not peace. It is not comfort. There is satisfaction here, satisfaction here, followed by huge weights, huge uh, uh, forces upon us, giving us anything but peace. And there are those here who know what it's like to come back out of that and, and to feel that peace that is real peace. It is the real new covenant peace of God that, that he gives through the power of his Holy Spirit as we walk in his ways. We are fed and watered and we are given peace. Tremendous blessing, something which we should never take for granted. Uh, let's go back to uh, Leviticus 26. Leviticus 26. Yeah, he says uh, here in verse 9, For I'll, I'll look on you favorably and make you fruitful. I'll multiply you and confirm my covenant with you. We see, no matter what we go through, we see the, the, the abundance that God gives us. We're eating the, whole, the old harvest and we're clearing it out because here comes the new harvest. I'll set my tabernacle among you and my soul will not abhor you. God places his dwelling place in us. I'll walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their slaves. I've broken the bands of your yoke and made you walk upright. God, God gives us that, that, that breaking of the bands of our yoke. And, and it is a, such a blessing to, to see that and experience that in our lives. But if you don't obey me, he says, and don't observe all these commandments, here's what comes on the other side. It is, it is a, a scary thing, but it is, it is real, and it is real for the New Covenant Church as we deal with the spiritual wicked, wickedness that is, that is everywhere around us. As we've often said, the same number of demons that were around in Christ's time are around today. The same number of demons who were around uh, in, uh, when, when Satan... Uh, Deceived a third of them, the same number are around today. They are still there. Uh, there is nothing to fear in that because as we are walking in God's ways, uh, our enemies flee from us. Our enemies flee from us. They, they leave us. They leave us. When we are not, they don't. They don't. Uh, look, look at Acts 19. Acts 19 this is, uh, I always laugh at this story, but it's, it's, it, it's not scary, uh, but it's, it's just reality. It's reality. It, it's a reality to help us as God's people understand 
the degree to which we don't have to fear because as we walk in God's ways, God is with us and, and the, the spiritual world views us in a certain way as, 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 as they look at us because we're washed in the shed blood of Christ and God sees, I mean, and, and they, even the demonic realm, sees God's presence and Christ's presence dwelling in us. That is not a good thing for them when they see that. Uh, look, look at Acts uh, 19, verse 17, uh, actually, yeah, 19, verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jews, uh, Jewish exorcists, these are Jewish individuals who cast out demons, they took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. So they would say, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches, that Paul's, Paul's teaching about, that, that person. We, we exorcise you, evil spirit, by that. Uh, so uh, there were seven sons, verse 14, of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, uh, who did so. So they did that. And uh, verse 15, the evil spirit answered and said, Okay, I know Jesus. Of course he would know Jesus. Jesus. God created all things through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the one who created these beings uh, that turned. Uh, everything was good as they created them, but that eventually turned. So the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and I know Paul, but who are you? And <laughs> what's he do? Well, what's he do? The man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them. He overpowered them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. What's the fear? The fear of the demonic realm? No. Fear and awe and reverence and respect for who God is, who Jesus Christ is, and the impact of God and Christ living in those who are walking in his ways and that the demons recognize that and they stay away from that. They stay away from that. Talk to an individual who uh, got into the depths of the occult or in, into some of these, these uh, areas of, of satanic, uh, satanic worship or even an individual who gets into serious, serious addictions and the impact of that on that individual and that, that darkness that they feel. Uh, uh, it is something when we come out of that with God's help and, and walk in his ways, uh, the difference that that makes. Look at, uh, look at Genesis 49, verse 22. Genesis 49. No, that's not what I wanted. I was going to hit that again, but I don't want to hit that. Let's go actually to Deuteronomy now and, and look, at, look at this. Deuteronomy 28, the other parallel passage. I apologize for that. Deuteronomy 28. Verse, verse 10 through 13 talks about uh, the, the degree to which uh, as we're walking in God's ways and as the nation was walking in God's ways, that in verse 10, then all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of you. God will grant you all of these blessings. There, there is an actual, uh, I think, a parallel in, in the spirit realm to the degree that we are walking in God's ways, that there is a protection that is there, that, again, Satan flees from that. Why does he run away? Uh, it's just because that's what the Scripture says. Uh, Satan does, does not want to be around that presence. It is something that, that he is not pleased to be with. It, it, submit to God, resist the devil, and he, he flees from that because it is everything foreign to him. Uh, look, look what it says here in uh, verse 15. 
so he says, But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully his statutes and commandments which I give you, that these curses then come upon you. Cursed in the city, uh, cursed in terms of the fruits of the land. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your land. Cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be when you, you come out. Uh, if, if we, as the new covenant Israel, are not walking in God's ways and turn from those ways, things start getting messed up. Things get really messed up in our lives. Even to the point, note, notice this here, as he says in verse 20, the Lord will send on you cursing confusion and rebuke in all that you set your hand to do until you're destroyed and, 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 and until you perish quickly because the wickedness of your doings in which you have forsaken me. Anybody that has been completely caught up in a sin knows this. You know how it, it creates confusion and it m makes everything else murky and creates these, these things in your life where uh, it's, just, it's just everything's messed up. And then we come to our senses on this with God's help and we begin to turn and then there's this razor sharp clarity of, oh, this is how this works. This is God's way. This is the truth. And as I walk in God's way, God does this for me. Yes, it's challenging. I battle this. But there's a clarity and the confusion fades away. Are you in confusion? Are, are you in confusion in some aspect of your life? Look at, look at this if you are. Look at this. What, what is there in my life that, that could be causing this? Because it is, a, it is a part of choosing not to walk in God's way that, that comes. Uh, look at, uh, let's look at here as he continues. Uh, the Lord will make the plague cling to you until he's consumed you from the land. The Lord will strike you with consumption, with fever, with inflammation, with severe burning, with the sword, with scorching. It's just not a very good situation. You even have to deal with mildew, verse, verse 22. Uh, you know, everything bad. And your heavens which are over your head shall be bronze. The earth which is under you shall be iron. In the end, it all begins to come unraveled. It, 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 it's going to be that way for the nations of Israel uh, prior to the return of Christ as they go into uh, ultimately into uh, captivity. Uh, and, and it happens in our lives to the degree that we don't walk in God's way. Verse 43, the alien who is among you shall rise higher and higher above you and shall come down, uh, and you shall come down lower and lower. You know, all kinds of passages through here that talk about what we see is going to happen uh, with, uh, with this nation uh, as a result of, of the, the degree to which it continues to go farther and farther and farther away from God. Let's look at... Uh, Let's look at 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. I talked earlier about what, again, I'm, I'm seeing a bit of and one that is something that Paul talked to Timothy uh, regarding the, the need for him to do uh, that I would ask uh, each of us to to do as I look at my own life and strive to do this, this, this whole discussion in, in uh, 2 Timothy 2, verse 14. Paul says, uh, 2 Timothy 2, no, that wasn't it. Where is it? 2 Timothy 2, 14. Oops, I'm in 1 Timothy, that's why. 2 Timothy 2, verse, verse 14. He says uh, to him that, that in verse 13, evil men and imposters are going to grow worse and worse. They're going to be deceiving and they're going to be themselves deceived. But you, Timothy, you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of. Brethren, the things that God has given us, the things that he's given his church are tremendous truths value those. We value those by studying them. We value those, but not by just reading over them in a cursory manner, but we, we, we value them by plummeting, plumbing, plumbing the depths, the depths of each of those truths and the impact of those truths on our lives and how understanding what God has given us through the spirit of, of, of his essence, this, his spirit, 
is given us to understand this, that as a result, we, we deeply appreciate that and seek to learn more and more. But you must continue in the things which you've learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you've learned them. And that from childhood, Timothy, you've known the Holy Scriptures. These Scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for, for, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that we can be thoroughly equipped so that we can be complete for every good work. He says, I charge you, therefore, verse 1 of chapter 4, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, convict, rebuke, exhort with all uh, long suffering and teaching. Because in the end, the time will come when individuals will not endure sound doctrine. But there will be other appeals. There will be itching ears. There will be other things that, that are, they, they seem like, oh, this could be good. I could, I could consider this. I consider this. Uh, but, but as a result, they, they, they've got itching desires, desires. They have itching ears, and they are according to, that are according to their own desires. It pulls them away because they heap up for themselves teachers, and they turn their ears away from the truth. These things are out there. These things are, are uh, able to pull us away, be it false teaching, be it our own pulls of, of, of idolatry that can get a handle on us as a, as a church, as individuals. Uh, where are we? How important is that to us individually? Let's go finally uh, back to Leviticus 26. Let's wrap, uh, wrap this up. Leviticus 26. You know, we serve a, a very wonderful and merciful God. When we come back to this, this different thread here, this thread of, of, of Israel, physical Israel, and what, they've, what they will go through, God in his mercy is going to restore them and give them that opportunity. God as he works with us, the New Covenant Church, as, as we deal with the things that we deal with in, in this life, the, the mistakes that we make, the errors that we make, the things that we can get ourselves over into sometimes, we serve a loving and merciful God who is ready and willing to take us back on that path again if we'll get on it. He's, he's ready and willing and eager to, to, to bring us back into the fold of his way of life because he wants to give us all the, the, the incredible blessings that he intends to give us with eternal life. But, but we've got to want it. We've got to want it. We've got to want to do that and follow him fully. Leviticus 26, in speaking of the end time, of what's, what's going to ultimately happen to Israel, but even then, uh, how God takes them back. Verse 40, Leviticus 26, verse 40. But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me, this is they've been in captivity, they've gone through all of this horrible thing, these horrible things, and uh, have walked contrary to me that I, that I have also walked contrary to them because uh, of what they did, God punished them. Their uncircumcised hearts, if, if their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they accept their guilt, you know, that's a huge thing in, in recognizing uh, turning from sin and walking in God's way is just to say, you know what, I am guilty. <laughs> I am guilty of this. I'm going to stop making excuses. I am guilty. God, I am not right with you. I need to get right with you. Accept our guilt and remember my covenant with Jacob, my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham. Uh, I will remember. I will remember the land. The land all shall, shall be left empty by them. It'll enjoy its Sabbath while it lies desolate without them. But they'll accept their guilt because they despised my judgments and because their soul abhorred my, my statutes. Yet he says for all of that, this is the kind of God that we serve. These, these individuals of, of Israel that he didn't put a heart into them initially. He says when, when, when they're in the land of their enemies, I'll not cast them away. I won't abhor them to utterly destroy them for I am their God. But for, I, for, for, the, for their sake, I'll remember the covenant of their ancestors 
whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. He brings them back. And God does that with us as we, as we recognize how we've turned from him uh, and accept our guilt and follow him fully. I, I challenge you in, in the weeks ahead to, to look at the blessings and cursings chapters and, and don't look at them just from the standpoint of, of modern day Israel and what's going to happen. Those things are going to happen. They are going to happen. Look at it too from the Israel of God perspective because God's dealing with us now. He's dealing with us, the Israel of God, who has God's Holy Spirit, and we're dealing with eternal life situations. These are important things, brethren. These are not to be fooled with. We serve a great and awesome God who wants to give us every good thing.